I am a firm believer in prayer. I have uh, put out a prayer letter for over 35 years now, tried to make it monthly. Sometimes it doesn't come out monthly. And I have said this many, many times. If it wasn't for the prayer of God's people, I would not still be in the ministry. I would have, I would have been out years ago. And um, I still write those letters. And on the back welcome podium thing, table, I have my August prayer letter. If any of you who are not already on my mailing list want to pick it up, read it, pray for myself, my ministry, and my family, I would appreciate it greatly. If you'd like the letter sent directly to your home, either via regular mail or email, um, just come up and see me and I'll get your contact information and I'll start sending it right to your home so that you can keep up with what God's doing and uh, some of the thrilling things that happens. Because of prayer, um, last month the Lord led me through a, a, uh, a thought process on his answers, on how he answers. And I shared it with the river group at Salem in the evening. So sorry, Carla, you're going to hear it again. But <laughs> um, because it seems to be something that bothers many Christians. Because what happens is, have you ever, ever prayed? And it seems like God's not listening. And you go, what's going on? God, in your word, you say, call to me and I will answer you. That's a promise. It's in Jeremiah. Amen. So how come I'm not seeing something? And a lot of times we start putting it on ourselves. What's wrong with me? What am I not doing right? What formula have I missed? What <coughs> Sorry. What principle have I ignored from your word, Lord, that you're not listening to me? And I want to tell you that that may not be the case. You have followed Jesus Christ. You have looked at his word. You have done some of the principles of prayer that we do find in Scripture. There are principles that if you ignore them, God has no obligation to listen to you. Okay, they are there. But Lord, I'm doing all of those. Why are you not responding to me? Well, I want to suggest to you that God is responding to you in his way. And we're going to look at three um, individuals. Well, one's a group, but anyway, who prayed to God and what God said to them. The first one is found in 1 Samuel. Some of you are familiar with a story. For some of you, this may be new. What happened is there was a woman. Her name was Hannah. She loved God. She was a devout Jew. She was married to a man by the name of Elkanah. And their marriage was a good one. Except for one thing. <coughs> Hannah had no children. And to be married in that time period was a, and not have children was a great disgrace. It was like something was wrong. And Hannah put up with this for years. And the sadness and the anguish was building up inside of her until finally, why it took so long, I don't know, but finally she prays. And here's what happened. Every year they would go to Shiloh and celebrate God. That was a Jewish thing to do. Great feast, great celebration, great time of worshiping God. And they would do this every year. Well, this one year, Hannah was feeling so bad 
of not having a child, which, by the way, her husband said, doesn't matter, dear, I still love you. That's my paraphrase, okay? That's not what he said. He actually said, am I not worth more than 10 sons? But the bottom line is, still love you, dear, doesn't matter. But to Hannah, it did. So she leaves the celebration. She can't even celebrate anymore, God. And she goes to the tabernacle. Temple hasn't been built yet. And she pours out her heart to God. Let me read what she says. O Lord of hosts, will you look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son? Basically, I want a boy. I want a child. Please, this is my only request. Now, as some of you know, when you pray, you can pray in your mind without ever saying it out loud, and God hears and he listens. He knows. And she was in such anguish that she couldn't even speak the words. It was that inner groaning that it talks about in Romans, but we're not going to Romans, um, where you just, ugh, to God. And God hears it. Trouble is, humans don't hear it. And what had happened is, Eli, the, 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 the um, high priest at the time, was sitting there, and he was watching her. Hannah's pouring out her heart. Her lips are moving. No sounds are coming. And to Eli, he thinks she's drunk. You see, this was a period in Israel's hi history where a word from God was very scarce. God wasn't talking to Israel. He was a little upset with them. And things were kind of just going on without God really being in it. And the people were doing, well, like it says in Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. So there were a lot of people who, though they claimed God, didn't live God. And Eli thought Hannah was one of them. And he goes up and scolds her and says... Put away your drink. Why are you drunk? And I'm going to leave the story there. Let's move on. We go to the New Testament and we find the man that we call the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Paul gives us a little insight into one of his own problems. Oh, there you are. In the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, Paul says this. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So here's what happens. Paul, because of all the great things he was doing, was heading towards the temptation of pride. And God allowed a thorn in the flesh the Bible doesn't tell us what it is, though it does give some hints that Bible scholars have said um, about it. Many believe that it was an eye disease that was great pain and he was going blind. They do that because of the book of Galatians. You can read it on your own, but he talks about his eyes in Galatians. So some people think the thorn of the flesh is he was going blind, but not just going blind. It was with great pain and 
for lack of a better way of putting it, ugliness. Some people think it was some person that was constantly badgering him, some enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ, that no matter where Paul went, this enemy seems to keep turning up. There was one gentleman who said, well, this passage is proof that God was married, or that Paul was married. Okay, ladies, don't get me. I didn't say it. I'm just repeating it. It didn't come from me, okay? But we don't know. And then another guy said it was his mother-in-law. Okay, so the mother-in-law jokes came through. The marriage jokes came through. But the seriousness of it is there was something that was ripping Paul apart. And three times he says, God, heal me. Take it away. Let's leave Paul and move on. That was his request. We have Hannah's request. We have Paul's request. The third request is found in the book of John, chapter 12, uh, 11, the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Very popular, very common story, but let me tell it in shortened form anyway. Mary, Ma Martha, and Lazarus were friends of Jesus. Their home was a place Jesus liked to go when Jesus didn't want to be Jesus. Have you ever felt like you're always on display because you're a Christian and you've got to be so careful what you say or what you do because you've got, you know, this reputation to maintain? Well, Jesus in his ministry, people were coming in him all the time and he had to be the minister all the time. Well, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus home, he could sit down and put his feet up to use one of our vernaculars, to use our, our phrases. He could relax in their home. They loved him. He loved them. There was nothing that could bother Jesus when he was at their home. It was a place of rest for Jesus. He had a, rep, uh, a reputation, a relationship with them like none other, not counting his 12. But as far as other people, they were the ones. He spent time there. We don't know how many times, we just know a couple that are mentioned, but we get the idea it was often when he could. That's where he went to rest. And Lazarus gets sick. And the sickness is getting worse, and Mary and Martha know exactly what to do. Send for Jesus. Now, Jesus is avoiding the area where they live, Bethany, which is only a few miles from Jerusalem, because it's, well, you know, Jesus had a lot of enemies from the religious people. They wanted to do away with Jesus, and this was one of those times where it was a little bit hotter than normal, and so Jesus was just kind of avoiding the area, doing ministry, about a two- to three-day journey away, so about 20 to 50 miles, depending on how fast you walked. Mary and Martha send a messenger. They tell him what to say. And I find this interesting. When they get to Jesus, they don't even use the word Lazarus. Lazarus. They say, the one whom you love is sick. Well, two things there. One, Lazarus and Jesus had a very special relationship because they didn't even have to use his name and Jesus knew exactly who it was. The other thing is, they played the love card, okay? You know the guy you love a lot? He's sick. You might want to do something about it. See, I'm reading a little bit more into it, but you get the idea. Come. There's the request. Three individuals or groups, Mary and Martha, three requests. Let's take a look at each person on the spiritual state of Hannah, of Paul, of Mary and Martha. Hannah 
was an Old Testament believer. She followed the law to the best of her ability, did what was required according to Jewishness. Technically, she's not a Christian. There is no Holy Spirit indwelling her. He only came and left on certain people for certain occasions in the Old Testament. It wasn't until Pentecost that we all got him. So technically, she's a good woman. Loves God. Not a, technically not a Christian. Paul. Super Christian. Okay? Had the majority of the spiritual gifts. Followed God through anything. Because he even says earlier in 2 Corinthians, I was beaten, I was shipwrecked, I had enemies here, I had weather there, I went through a lot for God. Super Christian. Many gifts and abilities, and the Holy Spirit indwelled him fully. Because Paul became a believer after Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes in to indwell us. Mary and Martha... And Lazarus, but he's not doing a whole lot right now. Loved Jesus. They believed in him as the Messiah, but still technically not Christians. It was before the cross. So if we looked at this for us, we've got different levels of spirituality. From nominal to highly dedicated. Okay? Three levels. Kind of like it is today. Christians who have accepted Christ as their Savior, but they still kind of want to live the way they want to live. Christians who are a little closer and try, but do a lot of failing. And then the Christians whose walk is strong with the Lord. Different levels of spirituality. Is that what makes the difference in how God answers? No. Because now we're going to look at the answers. We're going to see what God said. Hannah, Lord, give me a son. Eli, you wicked woman, put away your drink. No, I haven't been drinking. I've been pouring my heart out to the Lord. And at that moment, God gives to Eli insight, speaks to his heart, because what Eli says, I'm just going to paraphrase it. I'm not going to turn back. In the scripture, it says, may God grant you what you ask for. Okay, that's about... However, and I hesitate saying this because it always bugs me when people say it from the pulpit. I want to tell you right now, I am not a Hebrew scholar. I never studied Hebrew, but I know enough to look at other people who have studied Hebrew. All right? So I am letting you know there is nothing impressive about this statement. According to the original language, see, it always bugs me when speakers say that because it almost sounds like, look what I know. So I'm letting you know, I don't know anything, okay? I, I found this out. That phrase, may the Lord give you what you've asked for, actually says, the Lord will give you what you ask for. It was a declaration of prophecy. God is going to give it to you. And this is what, here's a hint is why we know that. Because the Bible says, uh, Hannah, immediately, immediately, her whole outlook on life changed. She went from being in anguish and depressed to being on cloud nine. She believed the word from the Lord through Eli. That this was a promise from God that it was going to happen. And she took it 
and ran with it. And you know what? Within a year, Hannah had a son. His name, Samuel, which means asked of God. She even made a testimony with his name. Asked of God. God gave Hannah an immediate yes. She prayed. Eli gave her the answer that she believed, and it happened. Paul, super Christian, close to God, prayed three times, and God said, no. I am not taking it away. Quit asking. Okay, now I sounded a little meaner than I think God was, okay? I, I did that on purpose. No, Paul, I'm not going to do this for you because listen to what God says to him. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. See, I purposely stopped and didn't keep reading. Now I'll keep reading. And he, God, has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. In other words, see, I told you he said it nicer. No, I am not doing this, Paul. I want you to keep that problem. Yeah, I know it hurts you. I know that you think you can't handle it, but my grace is sufficient. You're keeping it. No. Super Christian. No. Old Testament believer who we would say didn't know God fully because God hadn't been fully revealed? Yes. Now, here's something that might knock your socks off. You ready? In Scripture, I purposely left this out till now. In Scripture, there was another person who got a no answer for their request. Let me give you the request. See if you can guess who the person is. Father, if it's possible... Let this cup pass from me. Jesus Christ at Gethsemane made a prayer of anguish. Again, I, I like that word anguish. It kind of really sums up the emotion for Hannah, for, Paul, for all of them, and for Jesus. In fact, he prayed so hard, the scripture tells us that he sweat drops of blood. His capillaries broke and the little blood vessels mingled with the sweat. And so he was really, really in anguish. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, I don't want to do it. Is there any way out of this? Please do something so that I don't have to do it. I don't want to go to the cross. Why? Why? because he knew what was going to happen. See, a little sidetrack here. Jesus was not afraid of the beatings. Jesus was not afraid of the crown of thorns smashed down on his head. Jesus was not afraid of death on a cross. As, as horrific as it was, that's not the reason he wanted the cup passed. He wanted the cup passed because of you and me. Because the, we are told that God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might get righteousness. In other words, every bad thing you ever thought, said, or did was placed on Jesus. How could they do that when we weren't even born yet? Because he's eternal. He is God. Amen. And everything that the world has ever done, just to, what are we, about 30, 40 people 
multiply us by 5.7 billion. Well, millions to get to billions, okay? And whoever lived. That's what Jesus wanted to pass. He was sinless. He was perfect. He never knew what evil could be experientially until the cross. I don't want to do this. Let it pass. And God said, no, I will not let it pass. Now, if anybody deserved a yes answer, it was Jesus, okay? Any principle on prayer, he was living it, all right? There was nothing that could keep Jesus from getting a yes. Except one thing. One thing, which I will get to. Mary and Martha. All right, Mary and Martha. Loved God, loved Jesus, had a good relationship. Lord, the one whom you love is sick. Please come, heal him. And the Bible says Jesus purposely waited a couple days. Then he says, well, we're going to go. And I won't go into all the details. That's a whole neat story by itself, what the disciples think, what Jesus thinks. The bottom line is they travel the two or three days. They get to where Lazarus is. And the first thing that Martha says is, where you been? Where you been? If you had come when we asked, Lazarus would be fine. He's dead. Because you didn't come in time. You see, Martha had a very, very strong level of faith. And that's important. Don't forget that. Martha and Mary both had a very strong level of faith. It was just not quite understand, fully understanding faith. They had knowledge to a level. In fact, Martha's level even goes further because Jesus says, Lazarus will become alive. And Martha says, I know that in the day of resurrection. So she's got a lot of theology in her head. She knows a lot of stuff and believes it. Her faith is high. Just misunderstood. Basically, what Jesus did was he gave Mary and Martha a wait answer. Here's how I put it. Yes, no, and wait. What you ask for is good, and I'm going to do it right now because I want to. Wait. What you have asked for is good, I'm going to give it to you, but it's not time yet. The timing's not right. No, what you've asked for is not good. You're not getting it. You see, God always does answer prayer. It's just he'll say yes, no, and wait. So what makes the difference? Why does God answer the way that he does? Did it have anything to do with their level of faith? No, not at all. Every believer has faith. You know why I know that? Because you're a believer. For by grace are you saved through faith. 
So the fact that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior proves that you have faith and that that faith is greater than a mustard seed. So let's go back. Remember, Jesus said, if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, and it'll happen. Question, what's harder to do? Cast a mountain into the sea or for a sinner to repent of their sins? You see, the casting of a mountain is nothing compared to the turning of a soul that goes from the pit of hell to the kingdom of heaven. We have faith. There are people that will teach you, if you let them, that you're not getting answers to your prayers because your faith isn't great enough. That is is a doctrine from hell to make Christians feel guilty. You have as much faith as you need to ask God anything. And don't let anyone ever tell you you don't have enough faith. Because you do. Because you're born again. And the Holy Spirit himself is living inside of you. And you have all the power of God. And he's right there listening. So then, how come, Lord, when I pray for a healing, it doesn't happen? How come, Lord, when I pray for a job situation, it doesn't happen. How come, Lord, when I pray, fill in the blank, it doesn't happen? Well, here it is. Why does God answer the way he does? So that he will get the glory. That's the bottom line. It is for God's glory that he answers prayers the way that he does. So let's take a quick look at the three examples to see if what I'm saying even comes close to that. I, again, purposely, okay, now, I forget things a lot. I freely admit that. I, I, my memory is, ask me what I did when I was five years old and I can tell you. Ask me what I did yesterday, and I'm at a loss, okay? So I do forget things, but this time I left it out on purpose. I want to go back to 1 Samuel and read Hannah's prayer because I left something out. Ready? Um, verse 11. Chapter 1. Uh, let's go to 10. And she, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she made a vow. I left that word out. She made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son. That's where I stopped. Ready? Then. I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. In other words, he would become a Nazarite, a full servant of God, totally dedicated to the work of God. Hannah kept her promise. God knew that. So he gave her a yes, because he knew that the boy that she was going to dedicate to him would be one of the greatest prophet slash judges that Israel had ever had. Remember I said God wasn't talking because Israel was so far in left field that he just stopped talking to him for a while? The, the Bible uses it better that the word of the Lord was scarce, but God wasn't talking. 
when Samuel shows up as a boy, God starts talking to him. He's only a young boy being trained by Eli because he's now living at the tabernacle. Hannah gave him to Eli and said, here's what I had asked for. God answered, he's yours because that was the promise I made. Train him to serve God. And as a boy, God starts talking to Samuel. And he continues to talk to Samuel all of his adult life. Samuel's the one that ter helps turn Israel around to start thinking about God again. Why did God say yes? For his glory. Because he knew what a yes answer would be. All right? Paul. Paul had done so much healings, brought somebody back to life, um, started churches, led who knows how many hundreds to Jesus Christ, and he actually had a vision. His spirit soul was taken up into heaven, and Paul saw things that no other Christian that's on earth has seen. He says, I know a man, whether in the body or out of the body. We know it was Paul. He just says, I know a man to have humility, um, who was taken to the third heaven, and I can't even write what was seen. God won't let me write it. It's so great. This would have given Paul a great temptation to say, look what I have accomplished not look at what God has accomplished. So God made sure that every day when Paul wakes up, the first thing he has to say is, I can't get through this day without you. God gets the glory, not Paul. It would have been a great temptation for him to do that. And the thorn in the flesh made it so that he had to ask for God's help every day. God's grace is sufficient. Even when you're racked with pain. God's grace is efficient. Even when you don't know if the bills are going to get paid. God's grace is sufficient. So Paul was given a no so that God got the glory. And that's why Jesus got the no. If God had said yes to his son, you and I would be destined for hell because Jesus would have never took the punishment for your sin and for mine and for the world's. Jesus, who should have gotten a yes, got a no. Why? For God's glory. So that his kingdom would be built and all the lost could be saved. No, my son, the cup will not pass. And then why did Mary and Martha get a, uh, a wait? Now, because I have a uh, warped sense of humor, I do find this slightly amusing. Um, please don't judge me for this, but I'll tell you what it is in a minute. According to John chapter 11, 40, verse 45, it says, when Jesus raised Lazarus, many of the people there believed in Jesus. If he had just made him well, nobody would have thought much of it because Jesus was doing that all the time. But because there was a huge crowd mourning the loss of Lazarus, and he says, Lazarus, <laughs> come on out. And Lazarus does. 
it says many of the Jews. That's an important word because it means technically they didn't really follow Jesus as their Messiah yet. It says many of the Jews believed in him. Then, let me read this. This is, this is the uh, interesting, well, interesting part. In 12, chapter 12 of John, verses 17 and 18, it says, And so the multitude who were with him, Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, Jesus, because they heard that he had performed this sign. So now you have multitude, we don't have the number, coming to Jesus to find out what's going on. In other words, we're interested. Now here's the part that I find amusing just because I'm warped, okay? John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. The great multitude, therefore, of the Jews learned that he, Jesus, was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also. Because on account of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. I mean, it's got to stink for Lazarus. I just now get raised from the dead and they're out to kill me. <laughs> you know, see, I find it kind of amusing because it had to stink to be Lazarus. Because, uh, And you know what's interesting? We don't know what happened. Did the religious leaders fulfill the contract they put out on Lazarus? Did it not matter once Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead because now the attention was there and Lazarus was able to live out? We don't know. I have no scripture to back it up, but I think Lazarus was probably killed within the next couple of months. I really do. But there's no scripture to back it up. So if you want Lazarus living, please feel free to let him keep going. Um, but because God got the glory, Jesus waited so that the miracle was greater and more people came to believe in his son. Lazarus became a rallying point. What do you need to ask God about? What's your need? Talk to him. He's ready to listen. He's ready to answer. But the bottom line will always be who gets the glory because of this prayer request. You can be living, you can be a Paul, super Christian. And you may still get a no. You can be struggling in your walk with Jesus. And he'll give you a yes. And you can be anywhere in between. There is one prayer that God will always say yes to. And that's the prayer for salvation. In a group this size, I'm not going to assume that all of you are born again. Naturally, that's who I've been talking to. But maybe you're still one of those that are hearing what God says about repentance of sin and you just never have made that commitment yet. The Bible says this, call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Amen. To call upon the name of the Lord is to pray to him. Repenting of your sin. Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. Believing in what he did, did that faith. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. And then acquiring it for yourself. Jesus, come into my life. Take away that sin. If you've never prayed that prayer or a prayer like it, then I encourage you today to come up and talk to me, and I'll lead you through it. I'll help you. Talk to one of the other ministers that are here today. They'll help you. Or go to a trusted Christian friend that you know knows the way to heaven and they'll help you. But if you don't belong to Jesus, you need that prayer and you need that yes. He'll give it to you. 
Father God, thank you so much that uh, you are always here listening to us. You're actively involved in our lives. You want the best for us. Lord, we just ask that uh, you might keep us sensitive to your leading, to your guidance. Lord, when you give the no, help us to accept it, knowing that it's the best. When you give us the yes, keep us humble, continually trusting in you. I thank you for these who've come out today and ask that you might bless them in, in a way that is very real for them. Lord, there are many needs here, and you have the answer for all of them. Be with us now as we go our separate ways. May you guide, protect, bring us back again the next time that we can keep learning about you. In all these things, we say thank you. We love you. Amen. <laughs>